Well, it's uh, the 9th of September. I'm supposed to be at our air charter service in Toke about 6 o'clock in the morning. It's 10 o'clock p.m. the night before. Just uh, waiting on Mark to get through with his clinic and patients and uh, get his gear packed. And I'm doing the last minute pack, 11th hour, right before our hunt, trying to get it, get it going. Headed out for Moose, starting on the 10th of September. And uh, here's the mess that I have. Most float hunts start out like this one. Piles of food and gear staged for sorting and efficient packing to reach the field. In this case, I have 10 days of food, personal survival gear, inflatable rafts and river gear, and a palpable tension, hoping I haven't forgotten anything important. Zach gave me pretty clear instructions on how uh, he wanted to pack in these cub loads. So he told me on this on this uh, leg we're going to need to plan for myself and 50 pounds. Since we're using a super cub for field transport, gear should be packed in numerous small bags. And since we're doing a river hunt, these dry bags should be 100% waterproof, including everything from our daily grab bag and rifle, the sleep system, survival and field care kits, and especially electronics and camera gear. All other items should be separated for easy and efficient placement inside small planes. And I always start the adventure with a full one quart Nalgene of fresh water. Even my food kit is packed into a sturdy dry bag. I use watershed dry bags for all my gear. Our rafts and miscellaneous gear are separated into piles to make it easy for the pilot to grab and go on each shuttle flight. And once I'm in the air and approaching our destination, I'm finally able to decompress and start to focus on our field priorities, which include river character recon and game densities. Seeing that bull just got me fired up, boy. Landing on a barren ridge top is no easy task for a pilot. In our case, caribou scurried across the LZ as we made our first approach. So Zach had to make a second pass to test the wind speed and direction as well as to spook those boo off the strip. This is where a qualified bush pilot earns his reputation. You want a calm and skilled professional to get you safely to the field. With no time wasted, he's off to fetch another pile of gear. And before long, he's back on the ridge with our rafts and sleds. The final shuttle flight delivers my partner, Mark Wade, and we can finally get this adventure underway. Well, our plan is to go find some moose. Get off this ridge, make camp, check out the tributaries, see if uh, there's any moose traffic. Anything could happen on this trip. What you think about that, Wade? I'm loving it. I'm wondering how come this trip is so easy. Because normally these trips are harder. All right. If Mark and I have learned anything at all about remote river options, it's that ground conditions are always worse than seen by air. Always anticipate exhaustion and reward to be intimately connected. So saddle up, cowboy. 
It's gonna be a hell of a pack off this ridge. My goal with this film is to educate and entertain float hunters who plan to search off the grid for remote hunting opportunities. I'll deliver a clear picture of Float Dragon Alaska and demonstrate effective hunting practices aligned with important field dynamics such as conservation ethic, population management, low impact camping etiquette, and self-imposed harvest restrictions. And as always, meat care will be a strong theme as we bust our asses to make it all happen in 10 days. Good God. <laughs> Nasty, nasty portage so far. A lot brushier than I imagined it to be. A lot farther. It's a lot of drag. Trying to contemplate which side to go down. It's pretty steep all the way around me. Made it down to the river. It's a four hour. Let's see. Yeah. It was over four hours to go. Straight mile. I don't know where Mark is. We've lost communications. Haven't heard his whistle in a while. I'm gonna make a fire. Get out of these wet clothes that rained on me and everything is saturated. No rain gear on. So it's a uh, soak to the bone. Quick fire so Mark can see the smoke coming up hopefully and uh, get camp established. Float hunters must be able to establish a mature fire in under a minute. We're constantly battling wet conditions and our warmth, security, and survival depends on our fire starting skills. For this reason, I always bring about six ounces of birch bark and a couple of wads of four-aught steel wool and a magnesium striker. Everything else I'll need is collected from the environment. Well, it made it just uh, dark. I think I hear Mark whistling somewhere up on that hill. I don't think I can help him in the dark, so he's going to be on his own. But um, I got us a temporary camp set up. I got the uh, mega tarp, big enough for both of us to crash under, so we won't have to set up that teepee in the dark. Still have the fire going, I need to get that raging. And I have just enough light to um, get into some dry clothes and get my headlamp out. And then uh, we'll be fighting darkness. Mark's okay. That was a slugfest. Whoa, that was terrible. He's gonna be in a bad mood. He's gonna be looking for some Glen Livet. Maybe. <clears throat> well, a recap of day one. It took us all day to drop in using uh, Super Cub shuttle flights. Zach with Tok Air did us upright. And, uh,. We saw that bull way up on the hill, two and a half miles off, and we were contemplating whether it would be worth it to go shoot a trophy bull. We figured the walk would be much easier than it was, and it turned out that was one hell of a drop off. All that muskeg and those alders, willow, it was insane. Mark got stuck up there on the mountain 
He's about a quarter of a mile from me. I think he's finally got a bivy tent up. I made it down to the river right before dark, got this camp set up. Overestimated the uh, difficulty. We probably should have camped up there and uh, just had a full day of daylight to come off that ridge. Regardless, we're on <clears throat> a sister creek that will feed into the main fork that we'll be using. Start at daylight to go look for Mark, make sure he's okay. Get the boats inflated and uh, figure out what's going on downstream. I feel kind of guilty because I've got a nice mega tarp set up, comfortable for one person. Mark is not going to be comfortable up there on that wet mountain. I was able to have a fire, got the camp completely ready for him, and darkness closed him off. He was giving me the three signals with his headlamp for me to come up there, but I didn't feel very comfortable starting on something like that with no dinner, no rest in complete darkness? I don't think so. Good introduction to uh, what's become Float Dragon Alaska. Don't be filming me now. I haven't been to the salon yet. <laughs> <laughs> what was the hardest part about yesterday? The hardest part? Um, getting in the plane and coming here. No. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I mean, for me, it was, um, the rain didn't bother me. I mean, once you're soaked, you're soaked, you know? Yeah. That, didn't, that didn't bother me, but the hardest part was, you know, is in the dark. What time did you roll in? Like 3 a.m.? Well, I didn't get in bed till 3.30 in the morning, 3.30. That's by the time I got into camp at 2.30. Jeez. Oh, I know, because we looked at the clock. We left, I think, at 2, didn't we? But didn't we head out at 2 o'clock? Yeah, I think so. So it was... 12 hours. It was easy 12-hour drive. <laughs> well, at least I can laugh about it now. I wasn't laughing last night. Mm. Golly. Hey, there's a moose up there. Caribou. See it moving up there yeah. in the corner? Uh -huh. The crest? Yeah, is that a caribou? I don't know, it's got some, a lot of white on it. Can you see it in your video? Yeah, I think it's a caribou. It would have probably worth getting the binoculars out. Yeah. There's too mm -hmm. many of them to just one move. Yeah. That's good. They're gonna have to go a long way, like right into our camp. <laughs> yeah, maybe they'll come in for breakfast. Cause that's the only way I'd shoot one. Nothing special about this camp except that it's on dry ground. And we're not dragging. Unbeknownst to us, we had established our camp right in the middle of a migration corridor. During previous weeks, cows and young bulls lay down trail networks that the main herd follows to reach their winter habitat. Knowledgeable hunters use this behavior effectively to harvest caribou at close range. We had ample opportunity, but our focus was on moose. Besides, shooting any animal on day two of 10 is a bad idea for meat care efficacy, potential warm weather concerns, and unknown river character we'd have to negotiate downstream. Well, it's uh, midday, day two. I uh, scouted upstream a mile, mile and a quarter, just to get an idea of what we would have to deal with if we shot that bull. First thing I'm noticing is this isn't a, a stream that gets a lot of flow over the last several hundred centuries. A lot of these rocks are sharp. 
I would not want to have to float a boat through this. I don't think it's doable up that creek or down it. You saw, you know, average depth was just a few inches over those riffles and all of that, uh, the stream bed composition was really sharp. And, um, really sharp, surprisingly. These tight corners, those hairpin turns, bury against the high wall, which is usually a granite and other metamorphic rock. And it breaks off in shards at high stages. And over the years, it just hasn't been softened by the flow of time. That would make coming down crazy dangerous if we're heavily loaded. Uh, even having to drag over some of those sharp angled ripples would be a, a freaking disaster. And it'd be about two and a half river miles of that coming down. I'm not excited about the thought. So I guess the plan is decide tonight whether we're going to go for that bull upstream or go down to this bluff and maybe take a look, see at the main confluence. Hunting rivers from elevation perches overlooking quality habitat is like the analogy of working smarter, not harder. From these key terrain features, visibility of your surroundings improve and sound carries farther. Calling sequences are performed the same way as if from camp. Scraping and smacking trees is highly effective, and a bull's echolocation will draw him into your exact location. I usually thrash trees for a minute or so, then wait, watch, and listen for 15 to 20 minutes before repeating calling sequences. If there are moose within one to two miles up or downstream, you'll know it soon enough. It took this bull about 30 minutes to find us. He traveled downstream more than a mile to reach our perch, and then he searched cautiously for the bull that was making such an irresistible fuss. Four on that left side. Can't believe we're letting that bull walk. We had a perfect opportunity right below this perch. All right. He came right underneath us. Wide open, right on the river. That yeah. echolocation is pretty crazy, huh? Thin water. I think it would have been a different story if he'd have been a... <laughs> Wouldn't he have? I think so. Yeah. If he'd have been that big 70 incher, it, both of us, it'd have, like, it'd have been like a, a firefight. <laughs> Two rifles going off. <laughs> yeah. when, when he hit that gravel bar, that's when the green light was like, hmm. Yeah, that's no kidding. Right there next to the river? That was a freezer bull. 
four brow tines on at least one side. I on think both. I, I had my binocular. Yes, yeah, three. We should have hit that old basket head. <laughs> Not bad for day one. We had a shot at caribou this morning, multiple times, close range, and a moose this afternoon. Yep. I think we're going to top off the day by going and let, getting Mark to fetch his his raft is the word he's looking for. The legend. <laughs> the legend. The legend. Yeah, baby. The legend is a 50 pound canoe kayak hybrid capable of hauling a max load of one hunter, his gear, and a whole bull moose. But we weren't quite ready to test its load potential so early in our trip. Water levels were still too low and we had more than a week left in our hunt to explore this remote route. A worthy note about going remote is gear selection. Today, hunters can still be minimalistic without sacrificing basic comfort, and this cot is a great example. Thermarest makes this sleeping platform that weighs less than two pounds. It's easy to set up and break down, and it's an essential item on my packing list. It fits easily into a medium-sized dry bag, along with my sleeping bag and inflatable mattress. This Megatarp Bivy is another lightweight option that is compact and stows nicely into my survival bag. Using a Western Mountaineering down bag rated to five degrees. And uh, using that Mega Tarp had a lot of condensation on the inside, so we were both pretty, pretty wet this morning from all the heavy dew. It took several hours for this bag to dry out, but uh, with down, that's your that's your only option. If you leave it wet and pack it up, within a few days you're going to have a sleeping bag that does hardly any good. Takes a lot more time to deal with, but sure is nice. My entire sleep system weighs under four pounds and fits into this watershed dry bag, which is made of rugged PVC material and has a Ziploc style closure that is guaranteed 100% watertight. We also use a Goal Zero solar charger to keep our GoPros and other electronics fully charged on sunny days. The last step before leaving a campsite is to break down your fire ring and remove all non-combustibles and scatter the ashes to leave behind no trace of its use. All bags are tightly secured with river straps and carabiners as well as parachute cord. We pack our rafts to provide a well-distributed load configuration, which maximizes draft and improves its performance on the go. And my rifle stays on top and ready to use for those spur-of-the-moment shot opportunities.
Well, we made it right before dark. Got camp set up. Um, we sort of just had to find the best spot to, to choose for a camp. This wouldn't be our our target necessarily, but uh, it's got some promising sign. Boxed in behind me with the tall cliff. Right around here, we're boxed in by another cliff. So any traffic has to come 100 yards that way or 100 yards that way right up against this or straight through here. There's a fresh uh, rub over there on a tree from a bull in the last 24 hours. So um, all we can do is wait and see. Pretty decent. I've had worse spots. And it's the morning of uh, day four. Good night's sleep last night. I was actually quite impressed with the uh, layout. Perfectly flat. Uh, didn't wake up till 5.30. Got up this morning, did some scraping, calling. And we're about uh, 150 yards off that point. And uh, at that point, there's a good fresh rub on a tree. It's pretty sweet, but I think we're too much on top of the of the likelihood of an animal coming through. Could be wrong, but I'm just not feeling it. Anyway, I'm taking day four. I think we're gonna to try to slow our pace. We've got five days left for the season and uh, every day gets them one step closer to pre-rut. So they'll start uh, engaging us a little more. I believe we can just slow our pace and have a little patience. <coughs> Show you the bottom of the rafts after all the dragging and uh, sliding over shallow riffles. Man, yesterday we were cruising and you know we were breaking the riffles, busting across of them. If they had three inches of water, we were just sailing over them. About two inches, two inches we were dragging, but three inches gave us just enough cushion. And there's not a not a single rub or scratch on the entire bottom surface. So far I am duly impressed with the legend. Its performance on this tiny little creek is incredible. So far I've been uh, impressed with the, the extreme shallow that this boat performs with. But all these rocks make me glad that uh, we're not dragging meat off this creek. And I think we finally reached the confluence of a main stem up there. It's going to increase flow quite a bit. So for the last mile and a half or so, which is not that long, 
We've just been floating and dragging. I know you're wondering where the moose going to fit on that raft. With any luck, we'll show you. We're not in any hurry to burn through miles of our float. So we took a break from rising midday temperatures and gained vantage from side-lying elevation. From here we would glass and call for several hours before continuing downstream to find a strategic camp from which to call moose. Best looking spot since we've started floating. Great view. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Oh. On a float hunt, the most common question is how far to float each day. And the answer is, as little as necessary until you find a moose. I usually float from one good camp with fresh sign to another with likely promise. And this spot held my interest, so we made camp and started calling and thrashing. Lots of waiting. Probably call like that every hour or so throughout the day until it gets probably 11 or 12 and then shut it down for a few hours. And uh, kill some time. Wait for it to cool off some hopefully. Every day matters toward pre-rut. Still got about five days to pull it off so Got to have a little patience now. Downtime in camp allows a chance to burn all spent food wrappers and other trash. And you'll notice that we establish our fires over river rocks and at a location guaranteed to be swept over in the next flood stage. I know what some of you might be thinking. Did Mark actually bring a metal folding chair on a remote float hunt? Well, no. We stumbled upon an old abandoned trapper's cabin behind this camp, and Mark wanted to do his part in removing refuse from a wild landscape. Yeah, right. Wow. That is crazy. This right here is river lunch. You got your cheese, you got your ham. Mayo, fresh baked bread we made this morning. Packed with energy. Oh. All on a sesame seed bun. While Mark enjoys his hillbilly lunch, I decided to start an afternoon calling session with this old shoulder blade, which works just fine.
But when I thought about it, a big stick makes bigger noise. Nice lasagna with meat sauce and Cholula <laughs> and suckle busters. <laughs> suckle busters. I love it. Well, good morning, it's day five. Obviously no moose yet, but we're uh, gonna give it a go this morning. We got up about five o'clock to get ready and blaze out of here at daybreak and started to sprinkle so we thought well it's going to be a gloomy day and it's lightened up so of our spirits so we're going to hit the road and see what we can find downstream it's uh 6 30 got a little late start this morning but i think uh optimism is high nothing else we'll look for another sweet spot to glass from or still hunt stationary camps are going to work for me but i do like to call on the drift Day five, peace out. Mark made the rookie mistake of packing his on dry ground. <laughs> yeah. Oh. 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 This is a good point in our story to let you in on the bigger picture of why I selected this river and what my true intentions really are. Of course we're hunting moose and I'm confident that we'll get a nice bull somewhere downstream. But I'm also following a small group of hunters who hired me to plan their experience. I chose this river because it's so remote that I knew no one else would be floating it besides them and me. They have no idea I'm trailing their movements. My goal is to locate each of their campsites to monitor their field etiquette. And I'll also locate each kill site with any luck to observe their salvage practices. This is the first camp that I've found of the group that uh, I'm following behind just to see what sort of impact they leave behind. Hopefully try to find their kill sites. But as far as I could tell, this is the first camp and they floated probably four or five miles from the drop zone and uh, so far so good we'll see what see what they leave behind part of the purpose of uh, blindly following people who have no idea that you're going behind them is to really just manage the the footprint that the people that I'm responsible for leave behind and if I'm finding a lot of things that are offensive, then I include those educational opportunities in our videos and books. So it's the best I can do to help lower the impact in our use. This information will arm me with the necessary data to help me improve educational opportunities for my audience and clientele, which will highlight the most common camping and hunting missteps that occur in remote settings. Coffee grounds. Small fire. Right. We dump our stove here. And he forgot a spark arrestor, so I can kindly return that to him. Got the Kafaru stove going. So 
are the only refuse. Well, they built their fire in a good location. Or it's going to get washed away. But they didn't do all that great of a job. Cleaning up their mess. Not something that I would want an animal of any any animals of mine eating. I'd hate for my dog to eat a wad of aluminum foil packets. Probably that's really good for their colon digestive system. be all non-combustibles removed anything combustible is burnable look like they may have stayed here for a couple of days just about a wad of paper here Hope I don't find any shit paper. Well, I'm just about to leave and had to hurry to go to the bathroom. Thought I'd drive off into the brush line one more time before we departed and I think I found their mother load. It's clean over there. About 40, 50 yards from camp, 45 to be exact. They left me some deposits. So now I'm going to be delayed for another 30, 45 minutes while we make a burn pile and burn their poopy paper. I committed to cleaning up everything they leave behind, so tis what I'm going to do. And I'm not liking it. Dookie fire take two. Gunshots? Gunshots? It sounds like. It is what it was. Since these adventures are all about the experience of remoteness, it's all of our responsibility to protect the integrity of wild places and to completely salvage all edible meat from our harvests. Hearing those gunshots pretty much guarantees I'll have a carcass to inspect downstream. Dookie Patrol, take three. Evidence found, now in pursuit of white. Green. Larry Bartlett, Dookie Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> He's so glamorous. So, so glamorous. And to think he was going to put it in a Ziploc and take it with us. And that wasn't going to happen.
<laughs> Just had to do it, did you? Had to do it. At least there's no pine cones all over your boat. More camo. Is that what they call the matte finish? That's what I call the matte finish. Textured. It's pretty good in there. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Kind of greasy. Don't mix all that stuff. Do the minimum, is it 20, 20 pounds or 12 pounds or what? I, I don't know. And I've, I've never, that's never been an issue. Skank that whole boo. <laughs> By the way, in it, <laughs> whatever right. I get back is fine. <laughs> Damn right. That's right. Just make sure there's absolutely no flavor of caribou in that, that product that you give me. <laughs> Take more pepper, so be it. More olive, so be it. A different game animal. <laughs> That's right. If you want to trade it out for buffalo, I ain't gonna argue. You know, if someone brings in a dead raccoon that they ran over, I'm okay with it. <laughs> no argument for me. <laughs> if your dog dies, grind, <laughs> grind him up. <laughs> just don't give me any of that caribou back. Just give me the that f***ing skank of it away from me. <laughs> That's right. In the day five, and then we floated until dark. And try to get the tent set up as quickly as possible. It's nine o'clock. Probably have another 18 to 20 minutes before it is headlight worthy. Let's we'll see what day six brings. Once the sun came up, we found a fresh rub that was no doubt less than 24 hours old. The bull's fresh tracks made it obvious he had walked along the edge and crossed the river right at this very spot. Well, um, surprising turn of events just started off this morning. That's where we camped last night. Thought it was the best of all places that we could hope to find any moose traffic since there were fresh sign. Started off, floated to this gravel bar, and I saw some activity on that. Alas, the result of those gunshots we heard a while back. Left probably a pound of brisket attached. Probably a pound of meat off that, so about two pounds. We've gotten a lot more off the neck. Yeah, they could have they could done a little bit jo better job on the neck, in my opinion. That cut should come around to the jaw, so you can detach this giant muscle group. Take it off and 
think I'll go ahead and just take it off and weigh it. The neck and oftentimes the brisket areas are the most commonly neglected parts that hunters fail to salvage. The ribs and flank meat are a close second. And since the moose is such a large animal with roughly 600 pounds of available meat, potential yield left behind adds up quickly. The neck of a moose is a daunting chunk of burger, and hunters who don't effectively expose the entire neck area by skinning the hide to the ear and the jawline are the ones most prone to leaving dozens of pounds of edible meat on the spinal column. This is an important reason to approach each carcass with a three sweep technique. The first sweep removes the obvious bulk of meat. The second sweep removes the missed cuts that hug the bony anatomy. And the third sweep ensures that nothing edible is left for guys like me to find. And most hunters are unaware that the neck muscles actually extend inside the chest cavity and hug the spinal column just above the lungs on both sides. These cuts of meat are sizable and tender, so don't forget about them. My second and third sweeps rendered roughly 12 pounds of edible meat off just one side. That's all I could take off this side. I'm gonna flip it over and finish it up. I'm gonna call that two pounds. But I'm not gonna save it because it has bird shit all over it. So that's the kill side anatomy. Minus the two things that we haven't looked for yet is the primary and the secondary debris field. Usually the first one it's a circumference around the kill site where it's easy to throw stuff out of the way. That's a big chunk of flank and belly meat. Probably weighs about 12 pounds. It's not edible now, but it was when they were removing it. It's a big chunk of meat that could be ground up in burger. Then the Secondary debris fill is where all the small pieces that are usually suspect in terms of, oh, there we go, salvage. Um, yeah, there we go, that's a good example. Neck meat from around somewhere that wasn't appealing, and that's about that's two and a half pounds. Edible meat otherwise. Yeah, here we go. What's this? Oh big chunk of burger. That's three pounds. And that this perimeter is usually about 20 30 feet away from the carcass. And uh, psychologically I think it's to get it the farthest away so people wouldn't technically look for it but seems to be a common place to throw unwanted meat. All said and done I collected 17 pounds of once edible meat off carcass number one. I left 15 pounds of edible meat in the primary debris field because it was contaminated with bird shit. That's approximately 32 pounds of edible meat from this bull which represents about 5% of the total maximum yield from a large bull moose. This is unacceptable. And if Johnny Law had found this carcass instead of me, my hunters would have likely left the field with a hefty citation for failure to salvage edible meat from a big game animal. My next move is to locate their camp and return this meat and their trash to its rifle owner.
All right, let's go find a moose. Hey, LB. You might want to find your way to flicking that booger off your face. I'll take a quick peek at their uh, meat cache. Looks pretty good and well ventilated. Prevailing winds are up and down stream. Anchored well. Looks like they're in 15 bags. Tag bags. Nice little tunnel. There. Lofty, crunchy. Not bad, not bad. Nice. Pretty moist, but the bags are starting to dry. They're doing a good job with that. Pretty good. Little care package. Let's go over there and look at the horns. They got it tagged. They, did, they took good care of it. They did. They've done a very good job. Run a clean camp. This must be a favorite camping spot. See this? Chairs. Mm -hmm. They know what they're doing. Spotting scope. That's good, that's good. Let's get out of here. It was pretty obvious to me that these guys are ethical and efficient hunters. They run a clean camp and care for their meat very well. They do, however, need a little education and brotherly encouragement to improve their camping etiquette and to perform the final sweeps on their carcasses to ensure all edible meat is removed from each harvest. It's an important reminder to me that education is a continual requirement to reinforce the important dynamics that influence the wilderness experience and our collective reputations as backcountry hunters. Just had lunch and uh, we've been blasting down about 
two and a half, three hours since we uh, encountered that group in that camp. Figured we would uh, float down and give them four or five miles buffer before we start hunting again. We're getting close uh, to coming out of these canyons about two miles down. I suspect that it's going to open up into a nice meadow and that's where we're going to try to give it a go for moose. Seven bucks. Seven? Yeah. Mine's two ninety nine. Buy them by the thousands or no. what? You get that guide discount. What'd you think about today? Well, we saw some beautiful scenery. I like your raft though. I do like that raft. Yeah, I do too. Pretty rugged. They're taking some hits. Uh huh. Really maneuverable. That's what I like about them. And they float. I, I mean, I'm, I can float in like three inches of water. Yeah, that's what I was estimating. Three inches in my life. Yeah, that one's going to be popular. Yeah, baby. How do you like it now? How's that chair? I like it when I'm getting these little raindrops on me. It's leaking up there. My chair is so comfortable. As long as it doesn't start flowing this direction, we're in good shape. Well, we are uh, split up this morning. I went upstream and my strategy is just to uh, find every open meadow and call as I walk upstream and clear every gravel bar right and left. So from this view, I'm about a mile from camp. Found a meadow going back up against that hillside. Transitioning to another quarter of a mile or so, 600 yards maybe, open meadow, and a good view of the other gravel bar opposite the river side that we're on. For now, it's just a matter of time before we walk into a moose's territory and get in and stand up. Got a major creek coming up, up here, half a mile or so. We're gonna check that out. Mark's hunting uh, that Oxbow Lake that's now a spruce field just behind camp. Well, I just heard a gunshot back upstream toward camp, so I'm assuming that Mark has something down and that's good news because I haven't seen anything. I'm about um, two miles from camp, so I'm gonna put the camera down and charge back and see if I can find him, hopefully hard at work. I'm guessing by now he's uh, got the GoPro out and got a big cheesy smile on his face. Hopefully that means camp meet. Exciting. Well, I hope this picks up my voice because it's in the case. Well, today is September 16th, 2014. It's day seven of our hunt. It's been a really hard hunt for me. It's been some physical climbing down, bringing all the gear. It's been really hot. It's been unseasonably hot. And so we actually made our camp today to stay a couple of days. So this morning, 
we got up about five o'clock and we went out about a little after six and uh when it got a little bit lighter i climbed this mountain right here i climbed up on top of it not all the way about three quarters up and there was a bluff and i got up on top and it was real foggy i don't know if you can see the fog you still have a lot of fog and couldn't see the valley and lo and behold i made a little fire and i was sitting under a spruce tree just staying warm waiting for the fog to rise as soon as it rose up far valley there was a bull big bull and he started walking 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 then he got to a big beaver pond then he stopped he thrashed and then he started walking away he started ignoring it and then i called him again and he turned and looked in my direction again and he made a 90 degree turn he started swimming across that beaver pond he just started coming right now he's about three quarters of a mile to me so i knew that in order for me to get down that hill cross the river get over here i had to hustle so I ran down the hill, got over there, and I set up. I started calling. I didn't hear anything. Called, called, called. About 30 minutes later, didn't hear. And I was getting ready to give it up, and all of a sudden I heard a grunt. He came within 20 yards of me, but I couldn't shoot. He came in, posturing. I couldn't shoot. There were a bunch of trees between me and him, and he stopped. And I knew he was going to smell me, or he's going to do something was going to be wrong. And then he decided, you know, after I grunted a couple of times, he turned around and started walking off. And that's, I shot through the brush, which I learned in Africa. Shot through the brush and knocked him down. And he fell right where I hit him. He's a big, big bull. One of the bigger ones I've ever killed. So I came back to camp. I'm waiting for Larry. I'm sure he heard my gunshot. And uh, we're going to go back and it's about almost 10 o'clock in the morning. So... We'll spend all day cleaning that bull. So we got our bull. That's a big bull. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. I guarantee you that uh, most people would be already regretting not uh, pulling the trigger on that 4x4 four 40 four incher that we saw the first day. Because we were actually a little bit. But we just kept telling ourselves that that was a good stock to let go. Water levels were too low. And uh, just all things lined up wasn't the right shot at the right time. Early on in the trip, we persevered, we had patience, and we got lucky and found this bull, or this bull found us. And we got it done. That bull has some serious character. One of the best tools to have handy when you're moose hunting is a big old meat hook. Helps to get those hindquarters off the off the bone and I'm choosing a uh, number 70 taxidermy blade with a scalpel handle that's right a meat hook and a good scalpel blade sure. is only the start of good tools I also use citric acid powder diluted with water to serve as an acid barrier that retards bacterial growth and keeps blowflies from laying maggots on fresh meat the mixture ratio I found most effective is about two ounces of citric acid to one quart of water. I've adjusted the blend here to match my eight ounce spray bottle. You can see how that, uh, that cut along the jawline behind the ear from the top of the skull down to the throat. Oh, it really opens up those, that uh, neck tissue. And that is the, probably the best method of Ensuring that uh, you get all your, your neck need off, hopefully in one large chunk. 
So you got the, the one cut that went along the spine, all the way down the back of the leg, down past the joint, knee joint, and Mark will skin that back like I've already done the front shoulder. Almost ready. You can see how thoroughly I removed the back strap off this side by keeping my knife blade close to the bone and taking my time. And that pelvis is so clean that the Jays are going to be disappointed with scraps. When we're done with the neck, it'll look just as clean. And once we're done with the entire facing side of this bull, there will be no doubt of our intentions to leave nothing edible stuck to those bones. That's right. That's right. Who's the Shade Meister? It's this. It's the smoke. Yes. Yes, brusher. You've got to keep the smoke up and the bucks down. <laughs> yes. You ready to go skin that other half of the moose? Yes, I am. These sleds might have been of marginal benefit coming off that ridge top, but they served us well from the kill site to the raft. Dragging 150 pounds is a whole lot more efficient than packing it any distance on your back. Even still, it takes many a trip to get all that meat back to the raft. Expect four to six hours of diligent effort to render a moose to game bags and have it back in camp. Having these lightweight canoes made it an easy task to retrieve that bull. And once we finally reached camp, we could relax and soak in the glory of our achievements. Ah, just in time for another dehydrated masterpiece. <laughs> another favorite. Lasagna with meat sauce. Noodles and chicken. Ooh, you want to trade? No. You sure? I guarantee I don't want that lasagna. But I got sucker busters. Sucker busters. Well, we got a nice wind blowing from upstream, moving downstream. That's a real meat if I've ever seen it. Well cared for. Perfect spot to fall. Took us about four hours, it seems like. We're going to be feeling the pressure. Well, here at the meat cache this morning, uh, got down to about 28 degrees last night. And uh, it's starting to warm up just a little bit. It's still just under freezing, but uh, Mark asked a good question this morning, how, uh, what the depth of that, the cooling is on the core of the hindquarter. We thought we'd check it and see. Well, look at there, the little hindquarters facing us. I told him I'm guessing 59, 60 degrees. <clears throat> no, it's 50. 58 degrees. That's pretty good. Yep. <clears throat> Meat's doing well. That's good that we have a good cold recovery day. The sun was coming up, now I got covered over. What happened to that sunshine? Yeah, really. Almost kind of talked to something looks like a snow day. Mm hmm. We get those moose moving. Be more in, in, inclined to see one on the river. Right into our camp. 
Yeah, we need a bigger one. 65 just isn't, it's a dink. <laughs> <laughs> shoot, I'm happy with it. I am thankful we didn't shoot that dink up higher though, man. My goodness, all that dragon. Woo. And all that hot weather. That, those 60, 70 degree days would have killed us. Blow flies. Mm. Yeah. That knee would have been hard to manage for sure, but just getting it down river would be physically yeah. exhausting. Right. Exactly right. But let's talk about the most important thing on this trip. Sorry. This chair. <laughs> <laughs> the invaluable piece of merchandise was this chair. I this swear that's the only usable thing in that old driver's cabin. And it, it was a it was a treasure to find. And today's your birthday. If I was your best friend, I'd give you this chair for your birthday. <laughs> but you know, I, just, I just can't cross that bridge. That's <laughs> How old are you today, there, Big Lair Bo? Forty-three. Are you really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Now that you got that. Remember day. those days? Calendar just starts flipping over. Yeah, sure I do. Yep. What do you think those guys are going to think about me following? Uh, I think right now they're hoping they're going to survive. <laughs> How would you feel if if uh, someone you hired to put them into a place came in behind them and cleaned up after them? Well, so they'd already. Well, you mean I mean, clean how would up? that make you feel? Yeah. Like we did to them. Um, I mean, we talk about leave no trace. That literally means leave leave no trace. You try not. You don't want to leave any any trash or because you know eventually there'll be other people coming down the river and and we've both seen what rivers in Alaska look like when people don't take care of it with all the trash and toilet paper and aluminum cans and that kind of spoils the whole the whole experience. And you see how people just abuse the privilege of these pristine areas. So I personally think, you know, that they'll probably look at it as a little wake-up call. And in their future camps, they'll go through it and make sure that they burn their toilet paper and pick up their aluminum cans and, and their trash. It leaves me a little conflict on how to deal with this element of my business as a survivable resource you know, financially for me and uh, what I'm conflicted is how the business model is disturbing my peace about protecting places you know that are wild so that they're not overused All right how do you manage something like that when you can't control the access you know we're talking about public land I'm trying to develop that as a business model to sustain you know the economics of this industry in my small economy it's a necessary part of my business sure right and we, we've seen as this one example of how one group can go in and essentially diminish our experience if our expectations right. were to visit a place and not be intruded by other people the more people that are interested in going to these places the harder it is for me to do my job in, in finding really remote pockets that aren't right. disturbed by a human use. Right. In order to do that, I have to manage those small sure few do. areas. Absolutely. Uh, as far as my use, you know, and and that's being uh, critical about how much you take off the land. Moose, how many, you know, how many people you send down the river. I mean, a river like this can only handle one group a year right. for the experience to be had. But in order to protect the land and protect the resource, you have to self-impose certain restrictions. And if you can't, if you can't do that, you know, then I, I can't put you, you know, I can't take you on. Mm -hmm. And that's how you live with yourself. And personally, I think you'll have more than enough people say, mm -hmm. "Hey, there's two of us. We're happy with one, with one moose and one caribou." You know what I mean? Yeah for the experience of a lifetime. And then next year when we come back, we'll come back again and then I'll get the moose. Yeah. But I think that most people that come here from the lower 48 to have this experience recognize what this is. I do. But I think that there is an education level. 
I think that there's an education that you have to teach people about this place is like this for a reason and we want to do all we can to protect this and that you know not to, to be honest with you Larry I mean when people go camp in the lower 48 leaving toilet paper and, and cans like that that's it's kind of the accepted norm mm -hmm. you know but Alaska is such a unique and such a special place that your behaviors have to be unique and special and, and I just think it's a matter of education because I think most people that are willing to come here and experience this and, and understand just exactly that this is a this is a special place on the planet I think most people would respect that and and do everything they can to protect that in, in their behavior because granted you know if you think about that they the trash that they left behind and what they did in their mind they thought that you know this paper will break down this trash will get buried up and eventually you know our trace will be gone mm -hmm. you know and that's the mindset mm -hmm. and, and it's not that they you know they have we haven't found trash along right. the river and you know they're not like you know just just being it's their minimal impact right and I think that not I, absolute minimal impact and I think it's just a matter of education Mark is spot on. The only way to change human behavior is through education and motivation. Since 2004, I've led a movement to improve game meat salvage and preservation through field demonstrations and product innovation like books, videos, and game bag technology. And hunters are showing drastic improvements with handling game meat in remote settings. Education is key to highlighting areas of focus, but motivation has to come from the heart. If we want to improve our own experiences, we do so with enthusiasm and commitment. And through our actions, we encourage others to make similar choices that serve to improve the experience for themselves and for others. Right now, I'm providing shade and maximizing airflow to our game meat. Shade is critical in controlling storage temperatures of and around our food. You'll notice mid-morning temps on this day were around 51 degrees Fahrenheit. But in the shade directly over our game bags, it was 43 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 8 degrees cooler, which makes a huge difference in the internal storage temperature of our meat. By late afternoon, ambient temps in the sunny areas climbed to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. But under the tarp, the environment was a cooler 48 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a 13 degree difference and much more effective to continually chill the internal core temperature of this meat. The proper use of a tarp and mindful airflow improvements are key players in keeping game meat cool and dry, which extends the shelf life of our food by several days in the field. Once the sun falls behind the hillside, the tarp is pulled back until dark to maximize airflow and improve deep tissue cooling. I also rotate each bag every two to three hours while in camp. This helps to dry game bags and improves drainage and cooling of all meat cuts. And twice a day I perform sensory checks, which also include deep tissue temperatures, to monitor the effectiveness of my hands-on preservation. It's been dead 36 hours, but off the, off the carcass, about 32 hours. Our goal is to achieve a core temperature of less than 50 degrees by 36 hours post-harvest. So we're doing things right here. By morning, it should be about 45 degrees. I'll put it at roughly 40, 42 hours post-harvest. Ambient temperatures Climbed to about 62 degrees today. So far we're down to about 45 and dropping pretty steadily. I'm gonna give this some, some time to dry further and uh, drain as much as we can tonight. We'll put them in fresh bags starting off the float tomorrow and uh, make our way down toward the takeout. Try to get a plane out of here day after tomorrow.
We got lucky with overnight temps, which by morning had dropped to just below freezing. This helped reduce the core temperatures to the low 40s, which is a perfect storage temperature by 48 hours post-harvest. Awesome. Got that core temperature down to about <clears throat> four degrees. Sweet. That's what we like to see. Perfect storage temperature. After the first two days, I like to swap out game bags to offer our food a fresh, clean environment, which reduces gamey absorption odors and bacterial threats. Morning of uh, day nine. <clears throat> Let the meat cool all day yesterday. Rotated it about every two hours. Checked uh, and monitored temperatures. And this morning, woke up to about 31 degrees ambient. And our meat's uh, 41, 40, 40, 41 degrees core temperature. That's deep tissue, that's awesome. I'm just waiting for the dew to uh, melt off a little on the boat so meat won't be too slippery on it. So the plan is to load up this morning, <clears throat> float down to the takeout, and um, the pilot's going to show up in the morning. Hope that we should have five or six shuttle flights to get us out of the field and back to our vehicle. We'll see how, how good that works. But uh, should have a fun afternoon. When loading meat, antlers, and gear on the rafts, weight distribution and load security are essential. The center of gravity should be as low as possible with nothing allowed to rest on the floor. That requires heavy meat bags loaded first onto cargo platforms suspended a few inches off the floor, with the gear bags distributed evenly wherever they fit, balanced fore and aft and side to side. So you got everything strapped in, in front shoulder behind me, extra gear, largest bag of neck meat, and the hind quarter up front with the rest of my gear. Everything's clipped, strapped. Secure, no profile, no center of gravity. Mark's got the same. Every boat, every load is a little different. Depending on bag structure and design. Let's give a skew. Which where are you sitting? Right there. Right in front of the green bag. And I got three little small bags sit right there on top. It's so bright today. This is cloudy for photos. We can get the shade. Before leaving camp, the fire pit gets swept clean of trash and the ash is scattered so the next rain dissolves any evidence that we were ever there. Looks like you've got about floating in about three and a half, four inches of water. Feels good. Good.
and one. Another half? Another half more. Yeah. So right now it's really moving. Yeah, there's and there's a lot of water too. Yeah. I'm thinking I needed about five and a half, six inches. Yeah. Is that about what you thought? Yep. I'm thinking five. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, and it's easily maneuverable. So I just wanted to take some photographs, how pretty it was. It's a spectacular day. We've had a spectacular weather pattern. Couldn't have been a better hunt. It's been one of the best hunts of my life. And I mean that. Awesome. I appreciate that. Man, that's great to hear. As we arrived at our takeout gravel bar, a familiar sign that my group had stayed here. It made me wonder what else I'd find at this campsite. Saw a couple of ravens circling over this beaver pond this morning, just off river. Maybe 100 yards, 150 yards. And uh, found that group of second copies. Much, much better. As our pilot arrived, I pondered our experience and successes. I felt a sense of satisfaction with motivating my brothers to improve their salvage practices. But seeing that toilet paper reminded me that we still have a long way to go with improving our bad habits for the sake of others who might travel in our footsteps. Until next time, peace out.